Ya la. All right. Um, there's so many things we can talk about, but I think because of the uh, because we have so uh, our time is so limited, I'd like to keep the discussion centered around the chanting practice and the practice of uh, the path of devotion. But that just means we can talk about everything. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> the, the, the number one important thing that we're going to need as we progress on the path to finding out our true nature, to finding out who we are, is we're going to be able to, we're going to have to be able to pay attention to what we want to pay attention to. No matter how you look at it, no matter how you describe the path, no matter how you, you define yourself, ultimately we're going to be able to need to be able to put our minds somewhere and they need to be able to stay there. So that disqualifies all of us. So let's go have fun. What the hell? You know, Maharaji said, <clears throat> he said, if you bring your mind to one point, you will see God. Being God takes a little bit more work. But seeing God is pretty cool. I wouldn't mind that. But the point is, we have to be able to pay attention and to and and through the the chanting practice, the repetition of the names, we're training ourselves. We're getting the strength to let go of the obsessive thinking that we've been doing our whole lives. And it's not just that we think all the time. Like I said the other day, we believe everything we think. We believe every story we tell ourselves about ourselves. Every single story. I suck. I'm a piece of shit. Oh, I'm really great. I'm fantastic. We believe everything. And we never doubt that. There's no space in there. We're glued to those thoughts. We're glued to those stories. And as long as that's the situation, there's not a lot we can do to help ourselves. Therapy, all kinds of other practices can only help if we can learn to let go, if we can train ourselves to let go of our stuff. Otherwise, you just like, you know, you spend your whole life in therapy and then you die. <laughs> and you don't get happy for a minute. We have to, be able, we have to get the strength to let go. And that's what we're doing when we start chanting. We simply sing, and we listen, we hear the sounds that we're making and other people are making. And then we notice, oh, I've been gone. I, I, I haven't been paying attention. So at that moment, which is a very interesting moment, why should that ever happen? Why should we come back ever from that flow of crazy thought? Well, it's because of the work we ourselves have done on ourselves in some previous moment. Because most people, most people in this world get born, graduate from high school, drink some beer, and die. <laughs> and they're not here for one moment. Not one moment are they alive, are they aware. It's really, when you begin to open up to the situation of what this world is, you, your heart starts to break, and that's a good beginning. So, 
when we chant, you don't have to feel anything. There's no one special thing that's right when you chant. You simply sing, and when you notice you haven't been paying attention, after you've finished beating yourself up, you sing again. That's all you do. Eventually, you notice that beating yourself up is just another thought. So you just come right back again and again. And that, that, um, that action of coming back, it reverberates through our lives. It reverberates through the day. And without, it's very difficult to notice. But as time goes on, we spend less and less time in negative states of mind, heavier, negative, self-abusive states of mind. It's very difficult to notice because it's the noticer, the judger, that's going away. The one who's telling you those stories about yourself, which is who we are, that's what's not arising as often. And when it does arise, we have this mechanism that's, that's been empowered within us to let go because letting go always feels better. We come home for a second, or a millisecond, and then we're gone again. That's the way it works. But you never notice that. People don't notice that until you sit down and try to meditate. And then you go, oh shit, I can't stand this. What is this? But it's always like that, you just never notice, really. So beginning to notice that is a very good thing, even though it sucks. <laughs> People ask me all the time, what do you experience when you chant? And I say, how do I know? I, I, I'm, I'm, my job is to sing, not to be cataloging all the things I go through. <laughs> Who's that? Who laughs like that? <laughs> Very nice, thank you. That's a good one. I guess you catalog a lot, eh? Eh, I must be from Montreal. Eh. Yeah. For, for instance, I, I was born a moper. I moped around my whole life. And I have to uh, confess that I mope around less than I used to. Thank you. I have no idea. I, it must be one of the results of doing 50 years of this shit. But I'll take it. And in fact, I miss it. You know, it's so rich. You know. Sometimes I just mope around the house just for fun. And they go, oh, this is so great. <laughs> but we do spend most of our lives in this default uh, position, judging ourselves, pro projecting different things for different people, trying to buy this and get this, get this one's attention, get this one away from us. Our whole lives are navigating this. It doesn't have to be like that. I was telling you yesterday about fear, about Bernie's realization about how much fear runs our lives. Fear of being touched, fear of being exposed, fear of being seen for who we think we are, some negative take on ourselves. Which is why the cultivating of bodhicitta, or kindness and compassion for all beings, which Maharaj used to say, same thing, love everyone, all one, we're all one, it's all one, there's one of us. With fear, you never let that happen. One time I was sitting in, in the back of the temple with Siddhima, and a, a group of... Uh, the Tewari family, the family I was very, very close with, the cousins and nephews all came because the oldest 
grandson of Mr. Tuari was going to get married. He was the first one getting married from that generation. So there they were, sitting, laughing, joking with each other, and Sidima is sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I'm staring at these kids, and I cannot believe the amount of love among these kids, among these, this family. And I was just sitting there like this. And Sidima looked at me, and she laughed, and she said, you see, Krishna Das, you see? You see what you missed by being born in America. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? I mean, everybody in my family hated everybody else in my family. <laughs> the grandfathers hated each other. The cousins hated each other. My father hated his brother. His brother hated him. Everybody hated everybody. That's what I missed by being born here. A little love in the family. It was amazing. So I said to her, Mom, what is it with us Westerners? What's our deal? Why can't we love? Why can't we allow ourselves to be loved? She said some really interesting things. The first thing she said, said, well, what were your parents thinking when you were conceived? Oh. Then she said, what were they eating? Sacred cow. Then she said, and then she said, affection was used to control you as a child. Right from the beginning. And so immediately, it's business and not love. We needed to get what we needed from these big beings that seem to be the whole universe. That we needed them to keep us alive and feed us and take care of us and shelter us. So we wanted them to be happy with us. And they wanted us to behave in a certain way. So right away, business kicks in. You're giving something to get what you need. That's what's called business. You know, like relationships. Oh, come on. So, yeah. I understood why I grew up in the shape that I grew up in. I see my family. Not only do I, do I see how they thought of me, which was not that important, the most important thing was how did they see themselves? And that's what I absorbed from them, the way my parents felt about themselves. I absorbed that and I began to feel, my, feel about myself the same way. So, all of this is just stuff we have to let go of. It's like trying to wake yourself up while you're still asleep and you didn't set the alarm clock and nobody else is in the house, but you know you have to get up. There's something in there. You know you have to wake up at a certain time, but you can't quite do it. So we're asleep. We are not awake. We are not aware. And we're trying to get there. We're trying to wake up. But we don't quite know how. That's what practice is about. And it's not just an empty waking up. What it means is letting go of all the stories that shut us down, that close us off to ourselves and to others. It's not easy to let go of that stuff. But every time you come back, to Hare Krishna or Sri Ram Jai Ram or whatever, every single time you come back, you planted a seed. A seed of coming back again and again and again. And after a while, which is some indeterminate period of time, you don't go so far away so often, so, la so, so far. You, you stay at home more often. And it's a very different feeling. Maharaji said, Ram Nam Karne Se Sapur Ho Jatahe. From going on repeating these names, everything is accomplished. 
That's a big time statement from somebody who knows. So, but even, but I recognize, for instance, that I don't really believe it myself. You know, maybe for two minutes a day I believe it. But if I really believed that statement, if I could really wake up to what that statement is saying, the way I go through my life and through my day would be very different. But doing this practice, everything is accomplished. What more do you want to know? Oh, well, I got to know how to do a lot of things. Okay, see you later. Somebody, uh, this one guy calls me a lot, we talk. And you say, I, I just want to be a sadhu and do Sri Ram J. Ram all day. Okay, I said, do it. But he can't. You can't just do it. We're busy. We got stuff. We got lives that have to go on. We got people that have to be taken care of. We got food that has to be obtained and eaten. Mortgages to pay. Television shows to watch. We're busy. But those are all habits. And in order to overcome the habit of being involved with the external world, we have to develop new habits. There's no other way. We have to develop a habit of letting go. Even if it's for very short periods of time, even if it's just for two minutes, you just stop and just let yourself breathe, let the breath just quiet down, and then get stupid again to the rest of your day. And then you might remember again, so you'll sit down again for two minutes. Or you're at a stop sign or a red light. Don't close your eyes, just in case. Just let go for a second, again and again. And it begins to get familiar to us what that feels like. And we begin to crave that release from the prison of thought. Real love lives within us as who we are. It's not something we get from anyone. It's not something we give to anyone. It's actually our own true nature. And all these practices do is to uncover what's already within us. And when we uncover it within ourselves, we see it everywhere, all the time. All right, so we can do some questions. I'll ask the questions, you give the answers. <laughs> There's a mic. If you have something to say, raise your hand. I remember when Ram Dass decided to stop smoking grass before every lecture. <laughs> he was scared shitless. He said, what am I going to do? So I said, look, you just go out there. And you sit down and you say, we will sit in silence until someone has something to say. And he said, that won't work. Yes, it will. Just try it. So he came out. It was at Brighton Bush. He came out and he sat down and he said, we will sit in silence until someone has something to say. <laughs> Every hand went up in about a quarter of a second. So he was programmed for the whole, the whole talk. We will sit in silence. <laughs> There's a hand over there.
Hi, Katie. My name is Marie, and it's just a joy to be with you. In the, we've, we've been to many of your kirtans, and in the past, you've ended your kirtans with a saying about blessing all those that came before. Mm -hmm. And the last couple of nights, we've been doing Loka Samasta, which is beautiful as well. Is there a reason that you shifted from one ending to the other just out of curiosity? No. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> you pick. Um, so the words for the Hanuman Chalisa are printed and we can refer to them. So I've, this is coming from the perspective of somebody who's never been before a couple nights ago present at Kirtan. Um, and listening to the music is incredible, but obviously chanting the participatory act is what mm -hmm. kind of makes it work. Well, um, that's partially true. Keep going. Okay. Thank you for allowing the ignorance. But um, so the Hanuman Chalisa, those words are printed. That's easy enough to follow along. Some of the songs, I can readily discern what you're saying mm -hmm. and, and can follow along. But then there's the whole mass in the middle where I'm struggling to do anything but kind of mumble along. And so the uh -huh. question is, how, how do I figure out what's going on to be able to participate beyond just listening? Or is just listening enough? Well, yeah, I mean, you should have the words. Uh, who does, how many people don't know the words to the chants? Really? Go home. Okay, well, we'll try to figure something out about that. What can we do, Mike? They're in the folder. Pretty much most of them. If not, I'll get the folder and I'll actually look at it. And if there's a chant I'm going to do that's not in there, I will repeat the words for you, okay? Was that a deal? Okay. I was unaware that uh, there were so many people that didn't know the chants. But uh, we'll try to fix that. And as far as the, the listening and the singing thing, the first thing is the mental concept. You can't, nothing can come out of your mouth unless it's in your mind first. So even hearing chanting is planting a seed where it should be planted. The reason we sing out loud is it really helps us pay attention. If you try to just chant mentally all the time without having done a lot of practice, it's very difficult to keep the mind. It just gets blown around. But when you, external chanting involves the breath, involves the body, the ears hear, the tongue moves. You know, there's a lot more stuff going on, so it's easier to pay attention. But even then, it, the real name is inside. Hi, my Hi. name is Prema, and I'm hugely grateful, and I feel really blessed to be here. Um, I heard, um, I did a series with Nina Rao, who I was hoping to meet here, and I'm so sorry she can't be here, and I pray that everything is well with her family. And she said at the beginning of, I think it was like the intro, first one that we did, that her entire practice was chanting. She said, I don't meditate, I don't do, I, I just chant. And I was wondering, what is your sadhana? Do you do other things? Chanting is meditation. Meditation is, an, is, is a, a word. Chanting is a practice that allows us to calm our minds and open our hearts. Uh, that's what meditation can be. There are many types of meditation also. There's non-meditation meditation. Really? So when it's, it, it's, a, it's a generic term. Chanting is a meditative practice, of course. It brings the mind back from the far reaches of the galaxy, uh, somewhere in between your ears where you can actually slow down. So uh, I do all kinds of practices. None of them work, so I keep doing them. <laughs> I love this laugh. You have to be everywhere I am and laugh, except in the bathroom, please. <laughs> See? Look at that laugh. Is that fantastic? Hi, 
Uh, I just had a couple of questions that were more curiosity about you. Um, so when you decided... I reserve the right to take the fifth. <laughs> All right. Just curious. Um, so you described your family, and you also were part of a rock and roll band, and then you just decided to quit, and you went off. Did you have a sense of what you were looking for? Did you have any premonition that you were going to find something in India? Just curious. I already found it when I met Ram Dass. When I met Ram Dass for the first time, and when I walked in the room where he was sitting, he was sitting against the wall, he had his eyes closed, but when I walked into that room without a word being spoken, without any eye contact or anything, something happened inside of me. And I knew at that moment that whatever it was I was looking for was real and it was in the world, and you could find it. This happened in like a blink of an eye. And uh, that was a very big moment. It was after that that I quit the band and all that stuff, because I was ready to go up and live with Ram Dass. And I, I had already quit the band, but then they asked me to come back. But I had already moved out of my house, and I had my two dogs and my cat, and all my worldly possessions in the car. And I drove back to my school, old school, for a Jimi Hendrix concert. And after the concert, I was going to drive up to New Hampshire to, to be with Ramdas. That's when they asked me to come back, and I said, nah. And that's why we're here today. <laughs> if I had done that, I would have been buried a long, long time ago. So my, my second question is, how did you get into Kirtan? Did I? I'm still, I'm, I'll let you know when I get into it. Still working at Did it. Did you know about it? Well, okay, so the one thing that happened was <clears throat> when I first got to India, when I, we got up to the mountains, to Nanital, to the, there's a town near Kenchi where Maharaji was. Uh, he would say, we would go see him, he would see us for a few minutes and say, come back in three days. Come back in a week. So we had a lot of time in Nanital. I used to walk around the lake. And one night I was walking around the lake and I heard this chanting coming from the temple there. And that was it. I went, what is that? And I said, what is that? And, and I was standing out there just like, and some guy was going in, he looked at me, he laughed, he grabbed me, and he dragged me in. And I sat down with this bunch of guys in the temple, and they were rocking and rolling. And I said, this is, this, I could do this. This is for me. And later on, I realized they were singing Hanuman Chalisa. I didn't know at the time. It just was like gobbledygook to me, but like it is to you. But, but it seemed to work. So... Uh, yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for doing this. It's been wonderful. I had this um, incredible feeling this morning of, of being overwhelmed and having to look at everything it's taken in my life to get me here. And it was uh, really powerful. I heard of you first six years ago in a, um, in a ayahuasca retreat. I was locked in a room with 15 people and couldn't get out and saving Grace. Uh, no, Grace? I think that's the song. Um, came on, uh -huh. and I oh, completely yeah. panicked and thought that I was being indoctrinated into a cult and was trying to get out of the room. You were. And <laughs> it, that was six years ago. It literally is about four years ago that I realized that I, I was reborn at that moment from that song, from cool. so many things in that cool. room that were going on. I went down to Brazil to try and find something like I was in my life at that point to consume, to make me feel better about myself. And it was this total opposite thing where I realized that I could no longer run around the world and consume things to try and be happy. It didn't work. Including here in Kapalua, I used to come um, here to consume things. And this is the first time I've been mm -hmm. back since I awoke. And I think about the beach and how I used to slather myself with toxic things and jump in the ocean and 
how many things I would hurt. And now I wouldn't think of doing something like that. So thank you for giving me all that through a psalm. And um, one of my favorite um, talks that you have is on relationships. <laughs> Which you mentioned too. Yeah, I'm such an expert, you know. Uh, uh, me too, and when I he heard your talk on it. <laughs> we can just fuck up together, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It helped a lot. It always helps to have somebody to fuck up with. <laughs> My question is, when I share it with others, they don't necessarily bond with it too much sometimes. Finally, there are people with some, some you know, brains. <laughs> I think the concept that love isn't something you get from someone is yeah. really difficult for people. Sure. And, you know, I've thought a lot about that, but I'd love to hear your thought on why is that so challenging for people to move into a love that's not a possession? Because we were born in a culture that doesn't have any awareness of that. Nobody in your life that you ever met was looking inside for anything, at least for most of us. Certainly nobody in my family. Well, there was one saint in my family, my... Uh, my great-grandmother's sister was considered to be a saint. And her qualification was, she didn't complain. <laughs> That's what they call a saint. So yeah, we just don't know. Nobody is even interested in the Western culture in general. This, this, this awareness comes from, you know, from a, a different type of culture, a different type of reality which Western culture just has nothing to do with. It's all the mind, it's all thoughts, it's all possessions, it's all stuff, stuff, more stuff. It's not, it's not rocket science. Nobody's looking. And we get programmed by our families, our experiences, our friends, our schools, and our culture. The fact that we are somewhat identified with being on a path to something real is actually quite extraordinary, considering that we were all born in this, in this very, a culture with very little light and very little desire for, uh, to find real happiness. It's amazing that we're here at all doing this. Thank you. That doesn't mean it's gonna work. But it's amazing. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'm resisting my palpitations because public speaking is like a big fear of mine. But I'm breaking down my boundaries of fear. And I want to thank um, you for giving your talks and your chants. This healing journey is very new for me. Um, I feel like I've always been one with God as a child. I remember being like four or five years old and passing him here and being like, you look so stupid in that outfit. <laughs> And I came back to the mirror and I felt this voice that said, no, you're not. You're beautiful. Tell yourself you're beautiful because you are beautiful and then you'll see beauty. You'll see beauty in all things. And um, just mentioning that, there was something that was said last night that like pierced me so deep within my soul, which was, this is without judgment, but a statement that was made that I don't believe in God. I believe in Maharaji and I believe in love. But God is love. And I feel like there's such a mercy over all of us. And I feel like all of my gratitude and grace goes to him. But God doesn't need defense. So you taught me something. Because today I had to go within with why did that statement hurt me so much? I love you. I love everyone here, and the more that I embrace this healing journey, I realize how many more people in this healing journey don't have open hearts, and it just makes me that much more vulnerable, which is a trigger for me. It's a big trigger for me. But I'm so here, like, completely open, and I love all of you, and your music is, like, so fucking powerful. I hum to the shit I don't know. <laughs> But I love you, and I totally embrace all of this beautiful presence, and I just want to thank you. And I want to thank my son for introducing this, um, this path for me. So powerful. And, yep, I'm open. 
totally vulnerable. It's not all of it, but I fucking love you guys. That's it, man. Hi, Kitty. My name is Saswara. Um, Where are you? I'm right here. Oh. First of all, on behalf of my son, who is nine, who is very shy, I want to thank you for uh, having him meet his uh, musical hero. We listen to you every morning when we, uh, when we go to school. And so thank you. It, it means a lot to him, even though he doesn't want to say anything. I'll never um, forgive you for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I was first introduced to Kirtan when I lived in India and my grandfather died. Um, I actually connected. I was uh, nine, eight or nine years old. And my, it actually concerned my parents a lot that I was actually connecting to something beyond myself. And they quickly removed me from the room. <laughs> and here I am at 54 trying to reconnect again. I have a specific question, uh, something that's been really sticky for me as I do my work. And Ramdas kind of touches on this, and I need any guidance that you can provide um, in how, it, it's sticky because it sometimes works and it doesn't, and I know that's just part of it, and I, I, I try not to force it, but as I get into my late 50s, um, finding grace in the suffering of those I love, especially those older to me and very close to me, is really, really challenging, specifically parents. And I, 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 you know, every time I think I've made some headway and we get into close quarter battle, it, it all kind of falls apart and I have to kind of regroup myself and, and, and try to approach it. And I know it's my construct and it's my work, but anything you could say that may help me, I would appreciate it. Are you talking about your relationship with your parents? I'm not sure what you mean. I am. Yeah. I'm talking about my relationship and my perceived suffering. Mm -hmm. of theirs. And I, I, I say perceived because I recognize that, but it still gets to me. responsible for your parents' state of mind. They're responsible for that. Your job is to love them as they are. It's not to change them, it's not to save them. It's to let them be who they are and not close your heart to them. It's not, your job isn't to live their life, it's to live your life. Your life should, can include allowing them to be who they are and go through what they have to go through. They have your karmas, you have yours. And uh, to, to even think that you know what somebody else is experiencing is very arrogant. None of us know what another person is experiencing. We only know what we think they are experiencing. And that's different than what they are experiencing. And everybody has motives for what they do. We don't, we're not aware, you know, we don't know our parents as people. We know them as our parents. We don't know how many times their hearts have been broken. We don't know how many times they didn't get what they want or got what they didn't want. We don't know anything about their, how they were growing up. We may have a general idea, but basically we, we know them as these two beings who are a pain in the ass. But... Um, it's not your job to, 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 to save them. Just be with them and let them be who they are. You know. My mother came to see Maharaji. She came to India. Not, she didn't really come to see him. She came to drag me back to America. <laughs> but that wasn't going to happen. But, uh, but even after meeting Maharaja, she had a, a 
a relatively a lot of suffering in her life. So sometimes things just have to be the way they are. They have to roll out as they're rolling out. Uh, pretty much, I would say, what we call love, I mean, is, is letting somebody be who they are and not trying to make them be who we want them to be, who we think they should be. But that includes, that's real love, I think, letting somebody be who they are. That's who they're going to be anyway. So basically you're saving yourself from bashing your head against a wall for no reason. It's a big issue, you know, when things aren't working the way we think they should be working, like this world. You know, many years ago, way, you know, many years ago, while Maharaji was still in the body, one of his devotees came and said, Baba, you know, this world is in such bad shape. Really? Then? Forget it. Uh, I wish there was a king like Janaka. You know, I don't know if you know, Janaka was a, what they call a Raja Rishi, a saint king, an enlightened king. And he was also Sita's father, Sita's adopted father. And so this guy said, I wish there was a king who could take care of the world. And Maharaji said, there is a king much greater than Janaka. So... Let's just do the best we can, which is a lot. But that's our responsibility, to do the best we can. It's not to live somebody else's life for them. But to do the best we can is a lot. It means really paying attention to our lives, cleaning up our motivations, trying to treat people with kindness and compassion, and trying to treat people the way we would like to be treated every moment of every day. That's a lot. How do we get the strength to do that? If you ask me, my answer is going to be practice. Every time you come back from Nunu land, from dreamland, to remember the name, you planted a seed of coming back again and again and again. And when you're home, you can actually have some say as how you interact with the world. But when you're gone, it's all reaction. Mindless, automatic, mechanical reaction. If we're going to change ourselves and the world, we have to get here somehow, a little bit, sometimes. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, Maharaji brought me to you at your retreat in February. And um, on the first day, I asked you a question, and you asked me if I'd ever been in love. And I was like, no. <laughs> I was 34. I was like, no, 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 no. Um, and that was February, and now I can say I have. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. And the, yeah, you can definitely, okay. definitely chanting the names, everything can be accomplished. I really believe it. Okay. Um, but I keep letting go of Maharaj's hand. Don't worry, he doesn't let go of yours. I know, I know, but um, and you've said it. But I'd love to hear more stories about you remembering to take it back, if you would be so kind. Yeah, okay. Well, turn the monitor down a little bit. If you can, J.R. Maharaji is not a guy. He's not a 
being like us. He's what they call antaryami, the indwelling presence, the soul within us. That's who he knows himself to be. He's not somebody else. He's not somebody else who has a hand that he takes away or that we can hold on to. That's all personality stuff, me stuff. He's your own soul. And you're never away from yourself, not for a second, any time, in any lifetime, are you ever away from yourself. That's who he is. So the whole storyline that you ex expressed is what you have to let go of. There's no coming and going from him. He's everywhere, all the time. He's the sky in which, the space in which everything exists. There's nothing outside of that. There's no coming and going from that. The whole thing about letting go of the hand and taking the hand, that, that's, what, that's what devotees do to spend the time, to pass the time. That's what we do. We like that. But ultimately, it's not like that at all. He is all great beings, all fully enlightened beings, are fully enlightened because they know they are exactly, they are the whole universe, they are everything. They become one with the light that's in us. They, they are that light, they become that light. In every single being, there's a light of consciousness, of awareness, of presence. That's who he is. That's who all the great beings are. So, I mean, I don't want to be harsh, but you got to get over it. It's not, it's not useful to apply that, to apply that to your relationship in life with your with your partner. That's good. Take a hand, you got a hand, you don't have a hand. But where he's concerned, there's no going or coming. He's always here because we are always here. We don't know it. He is it. So keep letting go into that space. That's how you take his hand again. It's not outside of you. Deek. And when we chant, we are the names, are the names of that place within us that is the same in every being. That's God. But the God that Western civilization talks about is just an angry guy up there with thunderbolts shooting at you. That's not the guy I like. The God that is love, that lives within each one of us. So. These names are the names of that place. When we invoke those names, there's a part of us that turns towards that place. And the magnetism of that name, of that place, draws as a gravity. And it, those names draw us within until we can fully rest within us with, as ourselves, as our true self. So, and Maharaj himself was always immersed in the name. His tongue was always, his fingers were always counting off the mantras. It was just, there was a part of him that was just, it's just like Hanuman is always turned towards Ram. So, what does that even mean? You know, we don't we we talk about these names, these beings, Shiva, Hanuman, Ram. We don't have a clue what those really mean. But that's okay. We're working on it. Through the repetition of the name, everything is accomplished. Whatever that means to you is what it is. Through this practice, everything is accomplished. You can do other practices too, no problem. 
But the idea is that some practice has to be done in order to overcome the habits of being immersed in the, the external stuff and the stories and the, our versions of reality, which are all subjective. In order to overcome that and experience that one, some practice, some developing different type of habits is important. You don't do it, you don't do it. Nothing happens. You do it, maybe something happens. Every thought is karma. Every action is a karma. And every thought, every action, every karma has a result. So if we don't plant the seeds of the things we want, love, kindness, compassion, caring, openness, happiness, if we don't plant the seeds that will bring that, it ain't gonna come. If we plant the seeds of fear and, and greed and shame and guilt and anger, that's what we get. It's up to us. Karma is not fate that can't be changed. Karma is the key to, free, to freedom. You can make choices right now to plant weeds or to plant flowers. You have a choice. Maybe. At least it looks that way sometimes. Sometimes you think you're planting flowers and it turn out to be weeds. There she goes. But then you learn, aha, I thought that was a flower, but it turned out to be a weed. Well, you don't plant that anymore. That's called living and learning. And that's called mistakes, which are good. That's how we learn. Where are we? Hola. Hi. Hi. Um, so what has, what I have enjoyed the most on this retreat so far is to listen to the stories that people have to, that had experiences with Maharaji and Ramdas, like in the physical world. Um, and listening to them talking about it and or telling a story or something that happened. Like I haven't met them in the, in the physical plane. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, I haven't met them in any other plane, maybe, I don't know. But I love to listen to those stories. So I want to ask you um, if you could find one of the happiest memories that you have uh, with Maharaji or, or Ramdas or Dear's memory so you can share with us and you know, live it together. I would appreciate that. Thank you. One funny thing comes to mind, it doesn't have to do with me, it's uh, my Indian father, Mr. Tuwari, had been with Maharaji for 40 years. Very, very close devotee and a great yogi. One time he came to the temple and came to the temple and from the other side of the courtyard he started yelling at Maharaji. He said, why did you drag me here? I was happy at home, why did you drag me here? I had no intention to come. Maharaji goes, Hap! I drag no one, but for 87 lives we've been together. It had to happen. <laughs> great stuff. They, were, they fought all the time. It was so great. You know, when, and many devotees were not just respectful, but you know, they might be a little fearful of relaxing around Maharaji, but not to worry, he was out there. He loved to argue, loved to fight. Um, let me see what else comes up. So it was uh, November 1972, and Kenshi was closing up for the, for the winter. 
Maharaji had stayed at Kenchi longer than usual. Usually he was gone by October. But, but uh, so me and three other guys had been, four other guys, we'd been living in the temples for months with Maharaji. And one woman, Dropidi, our Greek goddess. And um, now, one by one, everybody was being sent away. The cooks were sent away, the chokidar was being sent away, the sweeper was being sent away, all the other devotees were already gone, and I knew that the hammer is about to come down. We're going to be sent away. And I, I had been with Maharaji every day for like five months. I could not imagine not seeing him for a day. I mean, I was completely freaked out. So I went and hid. Yeah. I'm hiding from Maharaji, who knows everything, right? I mean, who is the space in which everything exists. I'm hiding from that, you know, right? So I'm hiding at the back, like in the back of the Dharmsala, under the stairs, I'm like this, you know. And I hear footsteps coming towards me, down the boom, boom. And I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. And it turns out it's one of my uh, guru bhais, Balaram Das. He said, Krishna Das, Maharaji told me you were here. He's calling for us. <laughs> so I walked up to the front of the temple like this. And I'm, I'm ready for the executioner's, you know, hatchet to come down on my neck. And Maharaji says, quick, pack up your stuff. Take the next train to Brindavan. I'll meet you there tomorrow. Don't tell anyone. Yeah. So me and Balaram, we ran back to our room. He had like, he had like a camp trunk full of books. It weighed 370,000 pounds. I had the drum, the ektara, the harmonium, my backpack, the thing, the duffel bag. So we're carrying our shit, and there's this bridge across the river, right? So we're, we're like carrying this stuff across the bridge, and coming back on the other way on the bridge are our two beloved guru brothers who we've spent all these months in the temple. We are closest of the closest, right? And they look at us, they say, hey, what's up? Nothing. <laughs> and we kept going. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, the next day, Maharaji showed up in Brindavan, and we had like two or three days with nobody else there. It was fantastic. But, you know, he was too much, he just... In uh, October, November 1970, we were in Bodhgaya, which is the, the village where Buddha, the tree, the Bodhi tree is, the great-great-grandchild of the Bodhi tree is there, where Buddha sat and was enlightened. And there are temples there. It's really incredible. Now, I haven't been there since that time, but now it's bigger because, anyway. So we heard about this old lama who was at the Tibetan temple. And his name was Kunu Rinpoche. He was a, a very old, respected lama. So we decided to go see him. And uh, me, there were three other guys. So he, he was in room four. So we went up to the temple and looked, knocked on his door, and went in, and this little guy sitting in the bed with these big, thick Coke glass, Coke bottle glasses, you know, like, sitting there like this, very skinny guy. You know? And we sat down, and, and he's looking at us, he's smiling. He wants to give us mantra, but he has no teeth. So he went, I'm a mother. And he wanted us to repeat it. Like, what? You know? He goes, arm, 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 arm. We finally kind of figured out which one it was, you know. So, so then uh, we were going, and he reached into his uh, jacket, and he pulled out an old leather pouch. And in the pouch were these seeds from the Bodhi, Bodhi tree, 
which obviously had been, there'd been a lot of uh, ceremony done with them and you know, they were blessed and everything. So it gives us each one, and I'm going to put mine away to keep, you know, put it on my altar. And he says, eat it now, right? Oh, okay. I broke three teeth, you know. <laughs> anyway, I ate the seed. This was in like November 1970, okay? So then we were in the middle of these 10-day courses with Mr. Goenka. We, would do, we did five of them in a row, I think, you know, with a day off in between 10-day Vipassana courses. There was nothing else to do, so you meditate, right? No TV. So, uh, and then we got on the bus, and you know the bus story, right? Everybody knows the story, the bus story. Okay, thank you. I don't have to go and then, you know, life went on. We were there in Kenshi, we were in Allahabad, we were in Brindavan. Two years go by. Two, two years go by. And now, Draupadi and I have trailed Maharaji to Bombay, Mumbai. We, we, we figured out where he ran away to with who, you know. And so we flew to Bombay and we went to the hotel where... Uh, this devotee was staying because we knew that he, he would know where Maharaji was. So we're sitting in the hotel lobby all day and in the evening this guy comes in and he sees us. He says, Draupadi, Krishna Das, what are you doing here? I said, Mr. Barman, we, Maharaji's in Bombay, we, we come to find him. He goes, Maharaji in Bombay? Oh my God, I had no idea. He goes, so now, listen, come up to my room, you'll get some food, I have to go out, and when I come back, we'll try to find him. So, you know, Hara Kiri, we're ready to kill my, you know, we came all this way, he doesn't know where he is, what's going to happen, we'll never find him again, we'll never see him again, what are we going to do? We can't up. So I'm looking out the window in the room, and I'm thinking about jumping out the window, you know. The door opens, gone, who's there? And it's Maharaji. Barman lied to us. He lied to us, just the way I lied to my friends on the, on the, on the bridge. He knew. He was with Maharaji. So every day for like two weeks, Maharaji would come to the hotel room and spend all day with us. Or we would go to Barman's daughter's apartment where Maharaji would spend the, would spend the day. So one day I'm sitting there. Maharaji sits up and he looks at me. He said, give me the seed the Lama gave you. I, didn't, I, I truly didn't know what he was talking about. I said, seed? What llama? What, what? I mean, it's two years ago. I, you know, I, so, so many llamas, so many whatever, you know. <laughs> give me the seed. Give me the seed. Give me the seed. And, oh, oh. Maharaji, he made, me, he, he made me eat it. And Maharaji goes, take up the mukti ho jaga. He said, good. Now you'll be enlightened. And he laid down and went back to sleep. I'm still waiting. <laughs> this is what it's like you, to live with a being like that. There are no secrets, and there's nothing but love. He knows everything about you. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yep, mm, that too. He knows that. But he doesn't judge. All you feel is love. And after a while, your heart actually begins to trust a little bit. And that's what's really hard to find in life. That kind of trust. That we are worthy of love. Despite what we think about ourselves. And that's a big one. And because we don't have the karmic situation right now to be with a being like that it's up to us to bring ourselves into that presence which is always here there's no excuse you can make that love is here it lives within us it's not outside you can find it you just have to look if you don't look you don't find it's on us it's on each one of us. Ask yourself what you can do to live a good life and then do it. And my
my experience is that the chanting practice and other practices, that's where the strength comes for us to really manifest who we are, to be who we really want to be, not who we've been squished around into. Some practice is really necessary. Whatever that means to you, it's up to you to find what works for you, what you need to do. This retreat, these type of things, are where you, you bump up against different situations. Something might happen, some spark might happen, you might get a hit, this is what I could do. So you do it. But one thing's for sure, if you don't do it, if you don't plant the seeds of what you want in life, it's very hard to get it. Nobody can plant those seeds for you. Somebody can show you how to plant the seeds, can even give you the seeds to some degree, but we have to plant it. And we have to nourish it every day. Best we can. First time that I, hello. Where are you? Sorry. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for your talk. And the first time that I heard your music was in a savasana, in a yoga class. You were asleep. Well, you woke me up. <laughs> and I had no idea what I was listening to. Is he Indian? Is this even Indian music? What is this? Yeah. And I was so confused that I became almost angry and I started to cry. And fast forward maybe 10 years, and I was living in the Caribbean in Haiti, and I used to have a practice of doing yoga in my front yard under the stars, because we had no electricity. So under the stars, and I would see like the big image behind you of Maharaji, I would see him in the sky. Clouds, no clouds, that image was in the sky for me. Sometimes Ram Dass would join. And as I was just sort of in Savasana looking up at the sky, I heard your band playing. And no offense, but you're not big in Haiti. <laughs> Nobody's ever heard of you there, except for me. And so I was, it took about a minute or so to figure out, was I imagining this? Was I hallucinating this? what jokes were, was Maharaji playing on me. And it was maybe months later I realized you had been on uh, the Grammys. And so somebody was just playing the TV of you all performing on the Grammys. <laughs> yeah, right. But the timing was impeccable, so I appreciate that. That's good. My question for you is, I remember um, you hearing stories, or perhaps it was the film, um, of, of how difficult it was when Maharaji left the body. Um, and, you know, we with Ram Das have a, a, a beautiful archive, thanks to the Love Serve Remember Foundation and others. I'm so grateful to people who were recording him in 1973, and, I mean, they're just gems. It's almost as if the universe was choreographing his passing, his transition, and yet, right, and he would say, where have I gone? I'm still here. And he is. And yet it's, we miss his body. I think it's just normal. We're human. So I wonder what um, insight, advice you might have about him leaving the body and us still here in our bodies.
it's normal and it's human to grieve over some the loss of a body because we identify with our bodies so when somebody else's body is gone we think they're gone that's quite human quite normal um, but you know over the last 20 years or so after the stroke when I would come to Maui, Ram Dass and I would sit for hours together and we're not speaking at all. No words at all. Every hour or two we might say a word or two and go, oh yeah, okay. And I recognized after he left the body that we had already developed this way to communicate, be together without words or mental concepts at all just space, share that space together. So once the grief passes, which it will, it's natural, it passes, then what was in the background, which is the presence and the love, will, will appear more in focus for us. I miss making him laugh. That's, that's the thing most. I used to make him laugh. We had great fun together. Like one time, on a, Monday was the day that they went to the beach and he would get into the water and it was the only time he could be free of the weight of that body you know, in that wheelchair for all those years. So, but I would get there a little later because I'd get up later. So the, I arrived at, the, at the, uh, the beach and as I was on my way to the beach I saw there's a car parked over there and Ramdas is sitting in the car. And the door was open, the passenger seat. So I walked over, and he was stewing. He was just sitting there like... <laughs> so I kind of hunkered down. I looked up at him. He looked at me. And he looks at me and he said, I'm a fake. And you're a fake too. So I looked up at him and I said, yeah, but we're real fakes. And he just exploded. You know, just like. One time we were at the kitchen table after breakfast. We used to sit there for hours. And we had this long talk together. And I had recorded it. And so after we were getting ready to go somewhere else, I said, you know, I recorded this talk of ours. And he said, oh. I said, what should I call it? And he went, hmm, call it, call it uh, Dick and Jeff's Journey to Soul Land. <laughs> That's going to be my next CD. So, yeah, you know, don't get too carried away with it, you know. He's not, he's not upset. He's happy. Finally, he doesn't have to be stranded in that wheelchair. Probably flying around, having a good time. Loving all of us. So, don't let the grief go on too long and separate you from that, who he really is. That wouldn't be, that's just your stuff, not his. And you, so... That's just our stuff, not his. Okay, a couple more and then we're going to do something else. Good afternoon, KD. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. Um, so I uh, was listening to one of your podcasts, one of your medias. They're, I don't really remember which one. They're infinite. They are, yeah. <laughs> We did like 150 Thursdays in a row, I think, during the pandemic. <laughs> and I didn't have to get out of my pajamas once. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. My, uh, I guess I just wanted you to elaborate on something. There's a story you told about when you got into some uh, legal troubles in India, and you almost went to jail or prison for it. And uh, 
In India? It might have been in India, but uh, you, were, you were in court telling a story about how you were in court. Yeah. And uh, somehow or another, by Maharaji's divine grace, you got out of something. You were definitely sure you were going to go to prison yeah. for a very long time for it. Well, and uh, not that long. Hearing, hearing that story... Just, just, just a couple of lives. <laughs> hear, hearing that story made me cry profusely because it was centered around worthiness and how you yeah. didn't even uh, conceive the idea that you could be... Okay, I'll tell the story. Yes, please. <laughs> that, that's what I was going to ask, if you could elaborate yeah, and I, tell the story. I, I figured you would get there eventually, but, uh, you know... It's, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> it's really, it's very hard to tell the story because there's so many different streams that flow into and make this story. But this particular, what he's talking about is, I got into a little bit of trouble. Um, I, um, I turned the TV on one day and uh, watched a program I shouldn't have and got busted for it. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so I, had, I, I broke the law and I got caught. Although the truth is I didn't really think I was breaking the law at the time, but it turned out I was, according to them. The law, that is. And... Um, A friend of mine went to Siddhima and said that I was in trouble. And she, first thing she said was, was anybody hurt? No. So she said, she was quiet for a minute, and then she said, Hanuman will sit on the judge's hand and prevent him from doing anything to me. That's what she was saying. So we had that kind of guarantee. So then we're in court, and uh, uh, there's so much to start. I promise you someday I will tell the whole story. I'll write it all out before, half of it's probably already gone, but you know, I'll try to, because it's an amazing story. But anyhow, so I'm sitting there, there's two tables. I'm at the end of one table, and then over here is the prosecutor's table, the bad guy's table, right? who turns out to be like the guy who was protecting me the most, the prosecutor. The guy who's supposed to be throwing me in jail is the guy trying to keep me out of jail. It was strange. So before the, so the, the judge had gone into his chambers. No, no, it's before the court, before the, the, the thing, the sentencing it's called. Uh, I go up to the prosecutor whose name was Charles McKenna. The first time I met him, I said, hello, Mr. McKenna, and he said, Mr. McKenna's my father, I'm Charlie. And he shook my hand. This is the bad guy, okay, how are you doing? So I said, Charlie, he said to me, listen, you know, you broke the law, and as the top prosecutor in, in the, for instance, this district, you watch The Sopranos? This would be the, where they went to court, at this place. So with this guy, if they were real. So, um, so he says to me, you broke the law, and you know I'm going to have to ask for time that you that you spend some time in jail. I just have to do it because it's I'm the top prosecutor. If I don't do it, you know I, it wouldn't be the right thing. So I said, Charlie, just do what you ever have to do. It's okay. So we sit down. Oh, it's such a great story. <laughs> um, so we sit down and. Um, <laughs> My attorney was an 83-year-old black attorney from Newark who had worked his way up in the ranks from, you know, and was the highest, the most respected defense attorney. And everybody respected him because he only took clients that told the truth. And he said, I won't take your case unless you, you, know, you tell the truth. So the prosecution knew that anything that Ray, my attorney, said was true. So they respected him. It was amazing, the whole thing. Anyway, and the judge, the prosecutor gave us choice of judges. Like, how do you want to die? You know, 
flayed alive or, you know, like, you know, while you're making love, something like that. You know, it's your choice. So my, my attorney picked the top judge in the district who happened to be the son of his best friend, who was also a judge. So the judge comes out and says to my attorney, hi, Ray, how you doing? <laughs> okay, Your Honor, what you got for me, Ray? So my attorney says, Your Honor, I don't know what to tell you. Your Honor, I have to use a word in court I have never used in 50 years before the bar. What's that, Ray? Spiritual, Your Honor. I don't even want to take the guy's money. <laughs> this is my attorney. The, the judge says, oh, well, that flies in my court, Ray. I mean, the whole thing was like, what is going on here? <laughs> so then Ray says a few words, and then it's time for the prosecutor to get up and do the thing, you know, to request that I go to jail for X amount of time. So the prosecutor gets up, and he says, Your Honor, he, was, he cooperated as a witness, but his information was so old it was really useless to us, and, you know, and, you know, da, 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 and he sits down. and he won't look at me. He's looking like this. He didn't ask for time. He didn't say, you know, he should spend X amount of time. He just said, you know, he's not such a bad guy, and he sits down. So then the judge says, okay, I'm gonna go deliberate. And he goes off in his room and closes the door. It was such an insane scene, I tell you. In the front row was my friend Jerry, who'd been on the pile in 9-11 and he'd retired from the fire department, but he's sitting there in his uniform like this. It was just wild. So the judge comes out, and here's really what happened. The door to his chambers opened, and this wind, this invisible wind, filled the room immediately. It's like, whoosh. Ooh, and you know, Hanuman, son of the wind, right? And at that moment, I knew I was not going to jail. I just knew it. And the thing was, you see, I began to have a nervous breakdown sitting right there at that table because it was apparent that all these big guys and the law did not see me as somebody who should be punished. But I was not... I, I didn't want to, uh, it was okay for me to be seen as a bad guy, but it was impossible for me to accept being seen as a good guy. And I just was like freaking. And I said, Krishnadas, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I have to be honest with you, that's what I said. I said to myself, you were willing to accept the bitter prasad from Maharaji. You have to accept the sweet prasad, too. So I calmed my ass down, and that was that. And here we are. <laughs> I got to tell you this. This is just too funny. So they put me on probation. And... Uh, this, all this happened in the district in northern New Jersey, but I lived in New York, so all the papers had to go over to New York. So in the meantime, in the, I had arranged a tour in Europe, right? And tickets were sold, venues were rented, and I was waiting, but nothing was happening, and I, was, I had to leave for Europe. So I called Charlie, and I said, Charlie, I'm supposed to go to Europe, what should I do? They haven't gotten in touch with me. He said, just write me a letter saying when you're going, when you're coming back, everything will be okay. So, oh, there's so much to tell you, I can't. But, so, my mother was alive. She didn't know anything about any of this, right? So, when you're convicted of something, they, they make a whole report on you. So... I called Charlie and I said, you know, my mother's a cancer survivor. My father's got Alzheimer's. Do they really have to interview them? And he said, nah, don't worry. Tell the guy to call me and they don't have to talk to your parents. So I went out, but nothing happened, right? 
So I, my mother, I had to go out to help my mother do some stuff, and I decided I got to tell her what's going on because I don't want, want her to hear it from them, right? That would be even worse. But she got me so busy doing shit around the house <laughs> that I didn't have a chance to sit her down. So I said, Ma, I'll come back tomorrow, and I will finish up this stuff. So I go home. The next day, I'm, I go out the door. I'm getting ready. To, I'm on my way back to my mother's house. As the door closes, I hear the phone ring. And I thought, uh, all right. And I opened the door, and I caught the phone. And it's the, the, the probation, the guy who's writing up the report. And I said, oh, did you speak to Charlie about talking to my parents? Said, yeah, we don't have to talk to your parents. So I was about to tell my mother, if I hadn't answered that phone, if it had rung 30 seconds later, I would have told my mother and it would have been, all, you know, what it would have been like. <laughs> oh my God, you know, it would have been terrible. <laughs> so she, Maharaji, I, and the whole time I'm thinking is that Maharaji is not going to do that to her. I, I just knew that. So anyhow, so I go to see the probation officer. This guy's six foot four, got a gun, you know, sitting there. And he said, all right, so you're going to start serving your six months probation, whatever it is. I said, wait a second, have you spoken to Charles McKenna? You know, he asked that you call him. Yeah, I tried to call him. I, let me try him again. Here's what happens. McKenna, yeah, this is me over here at uh, New York. I got Kegel here. What's, it, what's this about in Europe? And then he gets all red in the face. And he says, what do you mean you'll, you'll take me out to lunch? It's my career you're talking about. So obviously what Charlie said, ah, let him go. If he doesn't come back, I'll take you out to lunch. <laughs> All right, so I went to Europe. I come back, and uh, then they told me I have to stay home for six months, which, I mean, come on, you kidding? It's like, I can sleep? I can watch TV? Come on, it's fantastic. So he said to me, uh, so I put an, uh, an, uh, an announcement on my website, and it said, the universe, in its kindness and compassion, has arranged for me to stay home and rest for six months. So I'm canceling all my appointments and everything for six months, and I'll see you all later. So then I went to my first appointment with this guy, with the gun and the whole thing. And I walk in, he looks at me, he goes, sit down. I sit down, he looks at me, he goes, the universe? The universe and the federal government... And he burst out. He said, he said, that was the funniest thing I ever saw. I showed it to everybody in the office. <laughs> the universe and the federal government. And he burst out laughing. You know, it's, it's... So that's the deal. Someday I'll write out the whole story. You can't imagine the things that happened. It was just, who wrote this script? Well, we know who wrote this script. See y'all later? Yeah. Okay, namaste. No